This episode is brought to you by our patrons over at patreon.com slash journey to micro. Our Patreon supporters are the reason videos like this can exist, and right now, we're trying to hit a new goal of 900 monthly patrons. Once we hit that goal, we're going to be making a special Microscopists React video where a few of us from the Microcosmos team are going to react to some of the good and not-so-good microscopy that we've seen in TV shows and movies. I think it's going to be fun. If you'd like to join our community and help us hit our goal, you can sign up for just $2 at patreon.com slash journey to micro. Also, if you have any microscopy-related scenes that you would like us to react to, let us know about them in the comments. Do you know what is in your water? Do you know what is buried deep in those depths? Sure, lakes and ponds have an idyllic quality to them, and you can even picture yourself spending a nice fall day in a canoe, your hand passing through waters that feel cool and refreshing against your skin. But then, perhaps, something else brushes up against your hand, too. A light touch that you ignore the first time, and then the second time as well. Even the third time, maybe you manage to keep your composure, though the movement is more insistent and squirming than the first few contacts. And as it keeps happening, you realize you have to see what it is. So you peek into the water, and there they are. Worms. Lots of them. And their bodies can tell us more about those waters than you might even want to know. The worms themselves are not that scary, though from what we've learned we imagine that identifying them is going to be kind of a nightmare. These worms are members of the genus Naeus, and even though there are only roughly 30 Naeus species, we're not sure exactly which one we're looking at here. That ambiguity feels a little incongruent with the worm that we see. This is not a particularly subtle creature to look at. There are large squiggles and bright colors, but the specific feature that scientists use to determine what species they are looking at is this. Those are tiny hairs, better known as kiri, and as you can see, they're quite small. And the number of features you could use to describe them seems minimal. Yet, scientists have to rely on these tiny structures to try and apply a name tag to the worms they are studying. In the words of one paper, the differences between these kiri are, quote, often subtle, inconsistent, and even overlapping between nominal species. Honestly, sounds like a nightmare to me. James, our master of microscopes, usually finds these worms in the ponds around him. They're very common, and they're also very useful, just in a kind of creepy way. Because these worms dance. And not to insult them or anything, but their dances are kind of unsettling to watch. The worms are partially buried in the sediment, but the part that we can see, well, they're hard to miss. They look like a hallucination you might conjure up of the Rockettes performing choreography inspired by an Edvard Munch painting. But the odd thing is that this dancing, this is what makes the worms useful to James. If the worms are dancing like this, it means that there's a lot of oxygen dissolved in the water. When the oxygen concentration starts to go down, though, the worms will start to emerge further from the sediment. And as the levels keep going down, the worms keep rising and rising in the water until they are right under the water line. And as they rise, they stop dancing. So for James, who is often looking out for organisms who might prefer a low oxygen environment, the dancing worms are his own biological oxygen meter, helping him gauge the conditions and its effects on the creatures he's looking after. And while this is very neat and very useful for James, it is also a bit of a mystery, because we have no idea why they do this. We've looked through papers and tried to find an explanation, but we only have our guesses. James thinks that their dance is most likely some kind of way to filter the water around them for food. But if any of you have an explanation, we would love to hear it. 
Now, this dancing isn't the first time that someone has used worms from this genus to understand the waters around them. In fact, Naeus worms have been an important part of a widespread scientific effort to understand something far more horrific. Between 1995 and 1996, researchers ventured to a lake near the village of Yanov in Ukraine to find worms. The village had been evacuated nearly a decade before, emptied of people and filled with radiation following the explosion of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in 1986. But plenty of animals remained, and scientists wanted to know what the effect of radiation in Chernobyl had been on them and the ecosystem around them. Some scientists looked at mice, others looked at carp and catfish. These scientists chose worms. After all, they are incredibly important in aquatic ecosystems, growing to large populations that help transport and transform organic matter throughout their watery world. So they gathered worms in the lake near Chernobyl, including two species of Naeus worms, and then they gathered the same species from a lake 20 kilometers away. These lakes were similar in many ways, similar temperatures, similar chemical compositions. The major difference, of course, was the radiation. The sediments near Chernobyl were loaded with radioactive strontium, around 55 times more than that in the distant lake. And the worms themselves were getting dosed with around 20 times more radiation in that contaminated lake. That radiation broke up bits of the worm's DNA, leaving fragments that were then patched back up, but not perfectly. The scientists could see the mistakes left behind in the worm's chromosomes. It's one thing to find a mistake or two in the cells. That can happen spontaneously. But what the scientists found was more than double the rate of that kind of mistake, leaving behind a buildup of aberrations embedded genetically within the worm. And the scientists also found something else, a change of behavior in the worms. Nothing like the dance we saw earlier, but something that's unexpected for these worms, sex. Now, Naeus worms can reproduce sexually, but they tend not to. In fact, this is part of why they're difficult to study compared to worms in related genuses. Often, those worms are distinguished by the shape of their genitals, but Naeus worms are so rarely engaged in sexual reproduction that they don't often have what scientists delicately describe as, quote, fully developed sexual apparatus that lack of obvious genitalia makes it difficult to identify them. And yet, in the contaminated lake, Naeus worms were more likely to pursue sexual reproduction compared to their counterparts, a strategy likely meant to help introduce variations in their genome that might allow them to adapt to the new stresses of their environment, particularly that radiation. Decades later, Perhaps that lake is filled with the worms born of those many couplings. And maybe they're there, dancing in the sediment, while they bear the genetic legacy of a catastrophic event. Thank you for coming on this journey with us as we explore the unseen world that surrounds us. These people on the screen right now, they are some of our Patreon patrons. We really, really like making this show, and we have a lot of people who support us, and we're so grateful for them. So if you want to thank anybody for the existence of this YouTube channel, these are some of the names of those people. And if you would like to join them, you can do that by going to patreon.com slash journey to micro. If you want to see more from our master of microscopes, James Weiss, you can check out Jam and Germs on Instagram. And if you want to see more from us, there's always a subscribe button somewhere nearby. <laughs>